I think about neocolonialism and the state of the neocolonialized, I am saddened because neocolonialism exists in an environment where you think you are free, but you are not. And I think Kwame captured it very well. He said that the colonialist does not change his character. What he does is to wear different masks. And you ought to be very careful not to think that he has changed and that his character will change. You've got to remember that his agenda remains one. He got it right, and that is why he wrote the book, for which many said, many say rather, he was overthrown. Neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism. The other person that not normally comes to my mind when I think about neocolonialism is Chinua Achebe. Writing in 1958 as a 22-year-old, he wrote a book that has remained iconic, Things Fall Apart. The white man is very clever, he says. He has come into our midst. We welcomed him. We thought he was our friend, but he has put a knife on the things that held us together and we have fallen apart. You can see that lamentation in things fall apart. Cultures are destroyed. Political organizations within African societies are destroyed. And when we regain independence, or so we think, we do not have a fundamental change of the things that we inherited from the colonialists. We retain the boundaries because we think it is dangerous to change them. And in fact, the question as to whether the boundaries should be revisited is an issue both in Addis Ababa in 1963 and one year later in 1964 in Cairo when the meeting is convened by Gamal Abdel Nasser. Nkrumah and Nasser are clear that we should, we should leave them the way they are because they think there will be African unity, but of course the boundaries which are artificial end up being the same that was set in Berlin in 1884-1885. And as John Henry Clark, that great American Pan-Africanist says, when there was an explosion of independence in Africa, there was no change in the governance systems. All African countries continued the governance system that they inherited from their former colonizers. So that if you are governed by the French, nothing changes. It's the same way that they did. If you are governed by the British, the same thing. If you are governed by the Portuguese, perhaps a little change. If you are governed by the Belgians, if you are governed by the Italian. So that in the minds of some people, there is only a change of God. You now have black skins occupying the same houses and same offices that were occupied by the colonizer. You now have them occupying the same seats and same offices described in the same way. So that the neo-colonial project creates another group of individuals. Historians and political scientists have described them in these borrowed French terms, compra de bourgeoisie. These are people who are still doing the bidding of the colonizer. In the former French colonies, they even have a pact which says, we have gone, but we have not gone. We'll still remain in many ways. We'll have our armies in your countries. We'll print your currency. We'll do many things. Even your universities will be connected to us. Your curriculum will be our own. Even in former British colonies, they still retain their armies. Their universities are connected to their own. And that is what one sees even today. So that 
even as we are fighting neocolonialism, the neocolonialist or the former colonizer turned neocolonialist has recruited individuals within our ranks. And the neocolonial project is now much wider. It is not the traditional colonizers who are involved in it, it is powers which have emerged. And Africa, therefore, becomes a theater, a theater of contestation. After the weakening of the European powers, the two major contenders in the world are the Soviet Union, which emerges after the Second World War, and the United States of America. And you can see that there is a contest, the ideological contest in Africa, where the conceptual West led by the United States of America, which describes itself as the leader of the free world, saying, move in this direction. And then there is another group which are affiliated to the Soviet Union and that time are saying, we are Marxist-Leninist. And there are two schools of Marxism-Leninism. The school that is following what one may describe as classical Marxism-Leninism or the Marx uh, theory as revised by Vladimir Lenin, and then after 1949, there is another school that says that they are Marxist, but as revised by Mao Zedong. So there is that contest. And that is how you see in the 1960s, mid-1960s, the school that is Marxist-Leninist are uh, thinking about running the countries with a single party state. This is the people themselves. They say that let us use single party states. And there is also an argument that is used, which is beyond Marxism. They are saying these are artificial states, many ethnic groups. If we allow political parties to be formed, they'll be formed on the basis of, uh, of, of ethnicity and tribalism, and it will break the country apart. So it is not true always that they were Marxist-Leninists. There are also other African leaders who are prepared to fight from a different perspective. It is in that regard that you must understand Julius Kambarage Nyerere of, Tanzania, of Tanganyika, then Tanzania. He says, I'm borrowing from different traditions. There are certain goods that are good, things that are good in the Soviet system, certain good things that are good in the Chinese system, and there are things that are good from African system, and he comes up with something called Ujama. Kenneth Kaunda in Zambia also comes up with something called humanism. In Kenya, we are ideologically not clear, but we come up with something called African socialism. In Uganda, Obote comes up with something called the Common Man's Charter, which is also borrowing much more from, uh, from, from uh, Julius Kambarage Nyerere's Ujama. In West Africa, we see uh, Kwame Nkrumah coming up with a system in which he says we've got to have a mix, and he's accused of being a communist. Patrice Emery Lumumba also comes up with a system. He's accused of being a communist. So too with the Secretary of Guinea and that kind of thing. All these are efforts at finding ourselves. The African first generation of African leaders are trying to come up with a governance system which borrows from the former colonizers. It is being done in an environment where they are also traditional rulers who are present, if you go to Ghana, they are traditional rulers and they have influence over the society. Go to Nigeria, the same thing. Go to Liberia, the same thing. You come to Uganda, you have the kingdoms of the Baganda, the Banyoro Kitara, Banyan Kore. You go to Malawi, you find them. You go to South Africa, you find them. You go to Eswatini, you find them. You go to Lesotho, you find them. How do you operate in this environment where there are different systems? The whole idea is we are trying to create a new state out of the colonial project. But... This is why fighting colonialism and neocolonialism becomes very difficult. The neocolonizer has also recruited people within your ranks. They have trained your army. They have indoctrinated your army. So you fight and move two steps forward, but you are moved several steps backwards. And that is why the fight is not easy. The neocolonialist keeps on changing shape, 
keeps on recruiting people from within our ranks and there is no shortage of people who want to be recruited for 30 pieces of silver. And that is why the fight is long, painful, and not easy to win. You know, when we talk about neocolonialism, I always remember these words of the Zambian called Simon Kapwepwe. Kapwepwe said, this colonizer who has become a neocolonizer will one day come as a foreign investor. And that is exactly what happened. So that apart from the French one, which is more vicious and more open, is that they don't even pretend, the, 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 there are also other streams of neocolonialism, but the French one is the worst. Because the French never left. And where they were kicked out, as in Guinea they destroyed things, as in Algeria they destroyed things, as in Mali they destroyed things. But theirs is the more obvious and more vicious because they control all levers. They control not only your politics, they control your economics, they control your resources, they control your education. So their brand of neocolonialism is, 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 is the most vicious. The other countries, such as the former colonies of Britain, what they did is that they leave you to run your politics. But even that, they influence in some ways. But how do they now remain in your system? They remain in your system by controlling your economy in different areas. If you look at former British colonies, you'll discover they still control your agriculture. They control your pharmaceutical industry. Until very recently, they controlled your banking system. They control your intelligence. They still have their military bases. They train your army. So they appear to have gone, but they are not too far away. And of course, with the new entrance into the arena, such as the United States of America, they control you through different ways, like their cultural centers. Find the British Cultural, British cultural Center, the French Cultural Center, the Italian Cultural Center, all these cultural centers, and NGOs. The NGOs are not innocent in this regard. These are Trojan horses. They continue to control your so-called civil society. So that you have a cadre of Africans who get money from non-governmental organizations, intelligent individuals, but their only claim to fame is that they write proposals and they write reports and they send them to whoever financed them. He or she who pays the piper called the tune. And the funding is based on what is important to those countries. When it was human rights, they tell you, you deal with human rights, then we'll fund you. When it is multi-party democracies, they tell you, talk about multi-party democracy and we'll fund you. When it is climate change, they tell you, talk about climate change and we'll fund you. When it is LGBTQI, they tell you, talk about LGBTQI and we'll fund you. So that you see that there is always something. The neocolonials is always hatching plots and getting our men and women, particularly those who are intellectually endowed, to engage in this activity because they know that if they control the scream of the society, then everybody will fall in, in place. Sometimes I imagine to myself the neo-colonialists in the inner sanctum sitting down and say, we must not allow this to happen. Let us come and hatch another plot and they're always hatching another plot, and we're always falling into the same environment through these plots, and we are always losing the battle. Even when we think we are winning, we are losing, because they know what they are doing, and they are several years ahead of us in terms of planning. This is the problem. They are involved in research at all levels, and we are kept squeezed. As they said, as I always remember these words, iconic words of George Floyd when he was being killed and they stepped on his neck and says, I can't breathe. The African can't breathe because the knees of the neocolonialists are on his neck, on her neck, can't breathe, is gasping for air. That is the state in which we are. When African countries are fighting the neo-colonialists, particularly in this day and age, when we see France's former colonies 
being toppled through the military and we are saying these are revolutions in their embryonic stage. We are not naive. We know that change of power through that method is not the best, but it is necessary. History has demonstrated that sometimes that is the best thing. And at this stage, African countries and African regimes also recognize that they are weak militarily. And this world is still a world which is a jungle, survival of the fittest and the dying of the least suitable. African countries are weak because they don't have weapons. They are weak because they don't have nuclear armament. That is why they are being intimidated on a daily basis by Western powers such as France, the United Kingdom, Denmark, and the United States. And So Africans, in my view, Africans who are discerning are capable of seeing that there are certain powers which historically allied to them at critical moments. During the struggle for independence, the Soviet Union, whose immediate successor in the eyes of many African commentators is Russia, helped. China helped. And they were never colonizers. So in as much as they know that many Africans know that Russia may have imperial interests, that China may also have imperial interests complete with an economic agenda, they are saying, that they are better than these others. They are better than these colonizers. At critical times in our lives, in our history, they have been with us. And to the extent that they want to help us again, we will embrace them because we know that they have stood by us. And I refuse to believe the argument that is being made by some that Russia has this grand agenda which they have been planning for many years to dominate Africans. I think Russia, like every other major power, is trying to relate with African countries in a manner which must be checked. Because Russia is, 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 is a strong country, and if we don't control Russian interests or Chinese interests, then we will not have a partnership of equals. But for the moment, the simple argument is, Russia is being beaten by the West. We are being beaten by the West. Let us put our efforts together. As we would say in Africa, when a wild cat is eating your chicken, and a friend of yours comes to help you drive the wild cat, that is your real friend. So Russia and China are friends of African countries because there is a wild cat, and that wild cat is eating our chicken. We'll deal with Russia when the wild cat is gone. That is the attitude of African countries, and I think that the engagement that we have, African countries have with Russia and China are a lot more respectful. Russia is not coming arrogantly like Europe and America does. China is not coming arrogantly like Europe and, Europe and America do. But yet there is need for Africa to also define herself as we relate with these powers going forward. This world, the world that Africa finds itself, is a very rough world. And as they used to say of the Greeks, be careful of the Greeks, even when they bear gifts, because Troy was conquered by the stratagem of the Greeks when they had this Trojan horse. The Chinese are coming with sweeteners, but if Africa is not careful, they also have an appetite they also would want to be a dominant power. That's why they have military bases in Djibouti. That is why Russia also has military bases. Anybody who wants to place their military in your country has an agenda which is beyond friendship. It is Indira Gandhi of India who once said that when a handshake goes above the elbow, it is no longer a handshake. And it is important that we keep our handshake with all powers, whether it is Europe and America, whether it is Russia, whether it is Turkey, whether it is China, whether it is Qatar, we must keep our relationship within the limits of a proper handshake, not a handshake that goes above the elbow, which could end up with your neck being caught. The law of the world 
is the law of the jungle, survival of the fittest and the dying of the least suitable. Africa must be fit, otherwise it will be smothered. Africa is now going through something that I personally choose to call a revolution. Not in the classical sense. Many people are asking, why are coups? Why are people celebrating coups? But the reason why Africans are celebrating coups in countries such as Guinea, such as Niger, such as Burkina Faso, and actually asking for coups in other countries is because the system of selecting leaders through the ballot box has been a betrayal. They have emerged a group of men and a few women in many African countries who have mastered the art of subverting the people's will. They rig the electoral system so that if you want to elect men and women who you think can serve you, those men and women will never ever be declared the winners of any election. The people have become helpless and in many countries you see people reverting to prayer and fasting. When you see a people reverting or resorting to prayer and fasting in order to achieve that which they can achieve by the sweat of their brow, you know that they have been beaten. So when young men and women in the armed forces are now rising, they are saying this violence, and they are not violent, that is luckily, but this method which is underwritten by the power of the gun is the language of the unheard. And they are in the forefront of the revolution, as midwives of the revolution. But the people must be vigilant because history has also demonstrated to us that those who seize power by the barrel of the gun sometimes don't leave it other than by the barrel of the gun. So that when they want to have power handed over to the civilian, we have seen men and women in uniform convert themselves into civilian. They simply remove the military uniform and wear suits and now they say, we are the civilians, vote for us. It is important that the people do not allow that to happen yet again. It is also important to know that those who are removed through this method are not sleeping. They will come back. You can already see in the Sahelian region that uh, insurgency is increasing in Burkina Faso, in northern Burkina Faso. Mali is almost de facto divided into two, in Chad, in Central African Republic. See that even in countries such as the Cameroon, the insurgency is increasing and I suspect they are being funded by those who want once again to subvert and to abort this revolution. Revolutions are not easy. They are no quick wins. It is going to take resolve. It's going to take time. It is going to take resources. All revolutions throughout history must be guarded and guarded jealously. I hope this time round, the changes that we are seeing will usher a totally new dispensation which will be underwritten by people's resolve. It gladdens my heart when I see the people of Niger encycling the French military base and daring them, shoot us if you can, but we are not leaving. It gladdens my heart when I see Mali Guinea and Burkina Faso sign a military pact and I hope that that will be the focal point or the fulcrum around which we'll begin to see an Africa that is new and free. Many people now ask, is there a governance crisis in Africa? And there is a governance crisis. There is a governance crisis because the systems that we inherited which entailed the formation of political parties which are not even ideologically founded in many cases, they are based on personality cultism or ethnic affiliation. These systems of having ballots in an environment where there is, no, there is a major trust deficit must be revisited. 
we must now go back into African history and ask ourselves, how can we govern ourselves by borrowing from other civilizations, but also looking inwardly? What happened among the Zulu that their kingdoms are alive today? What happened amongst the Yoruba that their kingdoms are alive today? What happened amongst the Baganda or the Manyoro Kitara that their kingdoms are alive today? Are there elements from there that we can borrow and have a system which will be acceptable by all? Because as it is, in many African countries, we, we don't trust ourselves. Even the ballot boxes cannot be printed in our countries. A ballot box has security features. Ballot Papers are printed in Dubai, printed in Greece, printed in France, printed in Belgium, because the people don't trust that they can print ballot papers. That lack of trust amongst ourselves is inimical to having a governance system which is sustainable. And the time is now for Africa to begin to ask what we can do about governance in a manner that is responsive to our realities in the knowledge that governance is informed by circumstances, history, and culture. And we can look at other civilizations. Look at Japan, bombed, nucleared, if you may, in 1945. Their emperor humiliated, but they went back to their system of governance, which was based on the emperorship and borrowed something from other civilization. Look at Thailand, the same thing. Look at Nepal, the same thing. Look at China, after the 1949 uh, Chinese party and the long march and Mao Zedong, they have slowly adopted things from other civilizations, but largely they are faithful to something that is unique to them. This is what Africa must grapple with. It is a difficult question, but unless we ask ourselves difficult questions, unless we ask ourselves uncomfortable questions, we will always have soft answers which are founded on quicksand, and our problems will become bigger and bigger. The time is now to revisit the question of governance. The time is now to ask ourselves when we talk democracy, who, who's democracy? Who defines democracy? Why must we have elections which are only considered good if the European Union says they are good? If the Americans say they are good, if the Dutch say they are good, if the British say they are good, that is when we accept they are good. The time is now for all of us to go through a process of choosing our men and women to represent us in which we say they are good for our sake. They may vary from one country to country, but I believe that that is what ultimately will be sustainable. Easier said than done, but must be done.